God is good all the time. And we're back in our series on Graceway, yesterday, tomorrow, and today. And we've entered the New Testament now, so uh, that's even better than the Old Testament. And so we're starting out with a tale of ten virgins, which is what we're looking at today. Before we open the word, let's just bow our heads. Father God, we thank you and praise you that uh, you love us so much. And as we open your word today, we pray you'll touch each person here just the way they need to be touched by you. Because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the story is told of a boy who grew up with the worst possible parents imaginable. Not only were they both drug addicts, but they'd both been convicted of several crimes, including grand theft, mail theft, identity theft, uh, blackmail, kidnapping. Uh, they were a real pair. And uh, they were all the boy had. That's, he didn't have any other choice. So when December rolled around, he went to his parents and he said, could you please make sure Santa Claus brings me a bicycle this year? And things weren't going very well for the parents. So they said, shut up, kid. Don't, don't bother us. But shortly after that, they were both arrested and went to prison for a long time. And the boy was put in a strict Catholic orphanage. And as he walked in the door of that orphanage, he saw the mother superior. And he said, uh, Ma'am, could you please ask Santa Claus to get me a bicycle on Christmas tomorrow? And the mother superior, the nun, frowned. And she said, we don't believe in Santa Claus around here. Santa Claus is not real. We believe in Jesus, and we believe in his mother, the Virgin Mary. And she pointed to this beautiful statue, two-foot statue of the Virgin Mary that was sitting on a platform there in the lobby of the orphanage. And uh, so the boy was pretty discouraged and uh, because he didn't know any better that night, which was Christmas Eve after everyone went to sleep, he snuck up, uh, stole the statue of the Virgin Mary, wrapped it in a blanket, tied it up very specifically took it up on the highest level, the roof of the orphanage on the top story. And then he went back to his room and constructed this ransom note. It said, uh, Jesus, I've got your mother. Either get me a bicycle in the morning or I'm gonna throw her off the roof and break her to pieces. So. Now that's what you get when you Google jokes about Christmas and virgins. That's uh, the best I could find. But uh, it is Christmas season now, I hope, now that Thanksgiving is over. I wasn't sure because the day after Halloween, I saw some stores already putting up Christmas decorations. But I'm not really the authority on that because I don't do a whole lot of shopping. My wife does a hundred times more shopping than I do, so she's the authority on uh, what stores are doing and when they're supposed to do it. But um, there is a point that I do want to make from this story, and that is, as a general rule, the fruit doesn't fall too far from the tree. If all you've ever known is crime growing up, then you're probably going to commit crime the first opportunity you get. And the, same, the opposite's also true. If you've grown up in a good, loving family, like I had the privilege of doing, then hopefully uh, you'll benefit from that as you get older. There are exceptions to both of these rules. Um, you know, I, I read a book more than 10 years ago now that was entitled Resilience in Children, back when I was still running the Keys Center in Orange County. This was one of the most interesting books because uh, it gave one example after the next of kids that grew up in the worst possible homes, worst possible environments, but they turned out to be wonderful kids. And the opposite's also true sometimes. Uh, I, I had a good friend, one of my closest friends growing up, 
And uh, he had the most godly parents you can imagine. I stayed overnight at his house on several occasions. And uh, his parents were just unbelievably kind, gracious, loving, had devotions every morning. They were like these amazing spiritual giants. But their son and his older brother were like complete hellions. Uh, they didn't want anything to do with religion or church or spirituality and they hated the devotions and so you know it's not a guarantee that uh, the fruit will fall close to the tree but as a general rule that is true but today we're uh, looking at a passage that represents uh, the last day church and uh, we find a neat division in this passage between true Christians and want to be Christians. And I wanna make three points from this story this morning that I hope will be helpful for us. Number one, what does the parable of the 10 virgins tell us about the demographics of Christianity? You know, the context of this parable, as I say, is the church right before Jesus returns. And we find it over in Matthew 25, 1 and 2. So let's start out there. Then the kingdom of heaven will be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. So let's stop right there and uh, recognize that this story really doesn't give us any insight or indication of what the percentage of Christians, um, you know, what percentage of the earth's population that Christians represent. We don't really get a clue from this story about that. But it does suggest that among professed believers uh, looking for the return of Christ, that there will be a 50-50 split between the wise and the foolish. Um, so we'll have 50% who are prepared to meet their Lord and 50% who are not prepared to meet their Lord. And I guess the bad news is that half of the church won't be ready to meet Jesus. You know, that's the bad news that we get from this. But uh, it's also good news at the same time because uh, George Barna and other uh, researchers like him tell us that only about 10% of professed Christians today are generally considered to be truly serious and truly committed to their faith. So uh, a movement from 10% up to 50% is pretty good news. You know, I guess we can celebrate that. Uh, but even more important, when we look at... Um, what this parable says about the oil and the Holy Spirit that we'll get into next, um, we have to recognize that the majority of Christians today who are spirit-filled tend to be, um, you know, a minority of the overall Christian church, very definitely. It's usually estimated that about 20 to 25 percent of Christians today would be considered spirit-filled Christians. So this tells us that that number is going to double or even more than double up to 50%, which would in indicate that there's going to be a pretty major revival in the church. You know, to have up to 50% of professed believers being spirit filled, anointed, baptized in the Holy Spirit believers, that's pretty exciting to think about. And that's really a fulfillment of Joel 228 that talks about in the last days my spirit will be poured out on all flesh and of course this was really fulfilled in acts 2 uh, when you go to acts 2 16 and 17 peter says that today the day of pentecost is the fulfillment of joel 228 this is what the prophet joel predicted and we're seeing it fulfilled right before our eyes. So really Joel 2, 28 had its initial fulfillment on the day of Pentecost. And Jesus accomplished everything that needed to be accomplished for the full revival, the full anointing, the full filling of the Holy Spirit to take place. 
Nothing more needed to be added to his perfect finished work for us to receive everything that God has given us. So it was available right there on the day of Pentecost and we got a beautiful taste of what would happen worldwide if what they experienced in Jerusalem at that time were to happen around the whole globe. And uh, I believe that the final fulfillment, we have multiple fulfillments typically of prophecy in scripture. And I believe that the final fulfillment of this is very encouraging that we would see, you know, half of all professed Christians actually being baptized in the Holy Spirit, anointed Christians. So that's good news. But let's move on. Number two, what does this parable tell us about the importance of the Holy Spirit? Let's go back to our passage here, Matthew 25, verses 3 to 9, and see what it says. Those who were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. Let's go two more verses. Do we have it? And the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves. So this is an interesting uh, story that we have here. And of course, the lamp represents the word of God in scripture. Uh, we get that from many places, but Psalm 119, 105 is one of them. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. There is a, uh, you know, not just in the Psalms, but especially in the Psalms, this parallel between the lamp and the word of God. And uh, so they all have the lamps. They all have the word of God in this parable. But there's no extra Holy Spirit. There's no extra oil for the foolish virgins. They're just relying on what their lamp can do. And I would say that's true for many Christians in our world today. They're just relying on what they find in this book. And it can easily be the letter that kills. If they don't have the spirit to go with it, we're in trouble, you know. That's what Hebrews 4.12 says. It says, rightly dividing the word of truth is dividing between the soulish realm versus the spirit realm. So those who read this book simply in the soulish realm, simply in the flesh, simply through their natural five senses are going to be in the category of the foolish virgins. They're not going to get what this book is intended to give them. It's only those who read the book in the realm of the spirit through spirit-led guidance and direction that the book becomes what God intends for it to be. And we see that distinction in this parable that the uh, foolish virgins have lamp only. Uh, they have word only. And the word without the spirit is dead. That's an old saying in church history. The word without the spirit is dead and the spirit without the word is dumb. You need, you need both. You need that combination of both. And that's what we see with the wise virgins. Uh, they're not a form of godliness without power. They've got the whole package. They've got both the word and the spirit. They have both the lamps and the extra measure of oil, which represents the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Um, but the lamp represents the gospel. It represents the word, which is the perfect finished work of Christ. That's, that's the fundamental truth that everything else in this book needs to be understood through. Uh, that's a Christ-centered understanding of scripture when the perfect finished work of Christ is fundamental to everything else and how we interpret and read every verse in this book. And I would argue this morning that if we have truly internalized the perfect finished work of Christ, we will receive uh, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Um, a, a true understanding of this book through the perfect finished work of Christ 
will lead to the greater uh, infilling of the Holy Spirit that allows Christ in you, the hope of glory. Uh, to be in Christ is to receive the perfect finished work of Christ, something that's outside of us. Christ in you is what happens when we get the natural result of the perfect finished work of Christ, which is then the outworking of the Holy Spirit and inworking of the Holy Spirit that comes through the perfect finished work of Christ. So that's what the wise virgins have. And, um, you know, the fact that they're baptized in the Holy Spirit and have the fullness of the Holy Spirit reminds us of the verse we read last week in Ephesians 5.18 where it says, keep on, or at least the correct translation will say that, keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't be drunk with wine, but keep on being filled with the Holy Spirit because we all leak and we all continually need more of God. Even if we've been baptized with the Holy Spirit at some point, we never rely on some past place in history in some linear way. We always recognize the need for continual infilling, a continual rebaptism of the Spirit in an ongoing way. That's God's intention. And that's what the uh, wise virgins have. But you might ask, well, how come they fall asleep then? You know, It says that they all slumber and slept, even those who were filled with the Holy Spirit. You know. And that might be disconcerting to some. It's, it's not disconcerting to me because I've been baptized with the Holy Spirit and I fall asleep. Uh, Barry likes to make fun of me when I fall asleep, especially if I'm sitting down talking to him or something. Um, you know, that's uh, not the best thing in the world. I will confess that I've never fallen asleep when I'm being paid for counseling. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for that. So if I start falling asleep when I'm talking to you, just give me a $100 bill or something. That'll wake me up, but I'm kidding. But anyway, uh, I am getting old, so uh, occasionally I do fall asleep. But hopefully it won't be when I'm talking to you. But uh, anyway, you know, I think this is talking about the fact that um, in our day and age and in the culture we're living in, there is a huge comfort level in the church. You know, Americans have been spoiled. We've never really known persecution for our faith as others around the world have. So there's kind of a ridiculous comfort level in the Western church and the American church. And there are also ridiculous distractions that more and more are out there through computers and all the crazy inventions and technology. And today we were talking about Sophia, this robot in Saudi Arabia who's been given citizenship. And uh, we're just living in pretty weird times, you know. And uh, I'm not at all happy about giving robots citizenship because their uh, intellectual capacity when they're plugged into the cloud to get every download from every single other robot, that's a little bit disconcerting. Uh, especially when they have rights and they can start persecuting us. <laughs> I don't like the idea of that, but uh, the left is bad enough without robots being added to it. But um, anyway, you know, what, what's going to break the church out of this slumber and sleep? You know, I really believe it will be crisis, it will be persecution. That's been typical in church history, that the blood of martyrs is the seed that really moves the church forward and in countries where Christians are being persecuted today, like China and stuff, we've seen a ridiculous increase of the church. The underground church has been growing like mad. But, um, you know, we are living in, in times where it's not hard to envision persecution for Christians in this country anymore. Uh, many years ago, I would have thought, you know, how are Christians ever going to get persecuted in America? It's such a Christian nation. But, you know, today we see this emergence of the left. And again, I always make a distinction between the left and liberalism. Because I believe liberalism is a good thing. 
I, I believe our founding fathers were a, a beautiful balance between liberalism and conservatism. And uh, that both of those things were very important in the freedoms and Constitution and Bill of Rights. And you needed that balance and both those things coming into play. But leftism is something altogether different. It, it's intolerant, it's vicious, it uh, is based on rules for radicals, use any means you have to to destroy your enemy. And, uh, you know, th there's no question about the fact that there are a lot of leftists that are just plain enraged in our culture today. They want to protest everything. They're, they're just filled with anger and hatred and, uh, you know, they feel so betrayed that they didn't win the last election. And there's just this huge revenge factor there that we've got to get back in control. And when we do, we're going to make sure that this never happens to us again. There's, we're never going to lose control again. And uh, I really believe that there is that kind of group in this country today that hates America, that hates what this nation was founded on, that hates Judeo-Christian principles, um, you know, that hates Western civilization. There, there is, we're dealing with something in this country that we've never dealt with before. And, um, you know, I, I don't, we were talking in the advisory board uh, Sunday about, don't be too pessimistic, my wife was saying, don't be too pessimistic, you know, she's a little more optimistic than I am, I think. And uh, it, it, there is a real tension there. You know, I don't want to be coming across as just pessimistic and a downer. But I, I think, you know, from counseling, what you try to do is prepare people for the worst case scenario while they are also fun able to function in a much better case scenario. But you want them able to cope even if things happen in the worst kind of context. And, and I really think that God's people want to be there too. We want to be prepared and able to envision what may happen so that we are prepared for it if that worst case scenario eventuates. But we don't want to just assume that has to happen. You know, we do see evidence in scripture that there's a very good chance something along those lines will happen because that's what the Bible says. You know, Revelation 13 says there will be a global world power that will control all things and all the systems of the world will come under it and no one's going to be able to even buy or sell if they haven't surrendered to this power. Uh, so God's people are going to have to really rely on God to function in this context. And, and I really think God's people need to be ready for that and, and not be taken by surprise when that time happens. But, you know, at the same time, I, I think it's very important for us to be happy, to be joyful. Uh, I, I feel very happy and fulfilled in my life. I love my work I, as a psychologist. I love my work as a pastor. I love the writing I'm doing. You know, the church isn't growing as fast as some would like. But I'm not really a church growth expert. You know, that's not my strength. And it's also really, I have to admit, not my kind of vision of where I think things are going. I really believe where things are going is you're going to see network of house churches that will be an underground church in this country and that the huge mega churches and denominations and all these are going to be faced with either compromise to the beast or they will cease to exist. And uh, you know what I was saying Sunday was if I was pastoring a mega church today, my goal would be to get every single person in that church in a little house church of 10 to 20 people, like Pastor Cho does in South Korea. He's got the largest Christian church in the world, but every single person in that church is in a house church that starts at 10, and once it gets up to 20, it divides into two more house churches of 10 and starts over. And they're worshiping together. They're taking care of each other's needs. They're, they're really functioning a lot along the model of what the New Testament church did in the book of Acts. And, uh, you know, I really believe that's always been God's ideal for the church. 
But when you're living in a country where there's no persecution, where there's all kinds of comfort and freedom and distraction, then people like mega churches. They like to hang out with the popular places. And, but all that's going to change. You know, I really don't believe we're going to see all that continue right up until the return of Christ. But um, anyway, if you get too discouraged, go talk to my wife. And uh, she'll keep us straight here. But, um, you know, this is where we get this notion of the midnight cry from this passage. It says at midnight, uh, the cry went out. And this was actually historical. This is exactly what happened at weddings in biblical time. Uh, the bridegroom and the, the spouse, the wife, would hide, and they would try to, uh, you know, surprise the wedding party. This was the big part of what happened at wedding receptions. And there would be all different dimensions to this. But typically, families would spend ridiculous amounts on a wedding. And it wasn't unusual for a wedding to last seven days. So you'd have all different stages of the bride and uh, groom participating in this wedding reception. But then towards the end, they would disappear and uh, everyone would be wondering when they're going to come back. And, and typically they would come back very late at night, hence this midnight uh, reference here. And, um, you know, it, it's basically uh, interesting that it says, when they hear this midnight cry, that the foolish cry out to the wise, hey, we're running out, we, our lamps are going out, we need your help, give us of your oil. And their response seems really selfish. No, we can't help you lest we won't have enough for ourselves. You know, it, it seems like just blatant selfishness here. But that's clearly not the message of the parable because the oil represents the Holy Spirit. And you cannot give your Holy Spirit to someone else. You can't give your baptism of the Holy Spirit to someone else. And that's why they say you have to go buy for yourselves. You have to have this experience for yourself. It's something that only you can do. Uh, we can't give you the Holy Spirit. We can't give you the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We can't give you the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We can certainly encourage you to do so. But I praise the Lord every day that I'm part of a spiritual family who are open to the fullness of the Holy Spirit and seeking the fullness of the Holy Spirit because uh, that's what the wise virgins have done. And finally now we move to question number three. What is the true biblical doctrine of the shut door in this parable? Uh, this is where the shut door reference comes from. And not a lot of Christians make a big deal of the shut door. Of course, Adventists do. Um, when I Googled shut door, almost every reference that came up had to do with Adventism because Adventism was built on this foundation of the shut door. It was the initial and the only truly original doctrine that came out of Adventism. And um, I'm not going to go into great deal here, but if you want to read great detail with references, read the third chapter of my book, The Prophetic Rift. Uh, it's called The Revolving Shut Door. And you will get all the references and all the historical basis for this. But let me just give you a little summary. Uh, in SDA history, the shut door was the first doctrine of the church. It was the first pillar doctrine, even before the Sabbath. And the Sabbath was not unique to Adventism. Adventists got it from the Seventh-day Baptists, from Rachel Oaks Preston. So it wasn't a unique doctrine to Seventh-day Adventism. Uh, and initially, Adventists called themselves the door shutters, Sabbath-keeping Adventists, the door shutting Sabbatarians. Uh, and there were even people who wanted to name the church that. I'm glad they didn't, but the door shutting Sabbatarians. Um, but anyway, this uh, shut door doctrine had really three phases to it. And the first phase was that only those who accepted the Millerite message could be saved. 
Everyone else was lost, if you can imagine that. Uh, <laughs> this is a New England phenomenon, but everyone else in the entire world that didn't accept this is going to hell. <laughs> That's a pretty interesting belief. But um, anyway, that was the first phase. And then after several years, you had some people come who wanted to join this little group for some reason. And uh, they'd never heard of William Miller. They'd never heard of the Millerite message. So there was real cognitive dissonance here. How can we tell these people that they're lost when they never even heard of William Miller? Um, so they revised the shut door doctrine to read only those who rejected the Millerite message were lost. Their probation was closed. They can't be saved. It doesn't matter what they do now. They're lost for eternity because their probation closed the moment they rejected the Millerite message. So that was phase two of the shut door doctrine. But what the vast majority of Adventists don't know, which is very fascinating to read, is that there was a seven year uh, belief, uh, the seven year movement it was called, in Adventism, which they didn't learn from the first two wipeouts. You know, the, the initial date setting was in 1843, October 22, and that one wiped out. So then they went to number two, which was October 22, 1844, and 99.9% .9 of Adventists would say, well, that was the last one, but that's not true. There was another whole movement, which included James White, Ellen White, the main leaders of the church, who believed that God, Jesus, was going to come back on October 22, 1851. That there was going to be a seven-year period here, and then Jesus would return, and everything would be made right. So probation had closed for those who rejected the Millerite message, and Jesus was going to return on October 22, 1851. So there was even more date setting <laughs> that occurred. And when that date finally passed, then you had some real desperation, because things are getting ugly. You know, that, that's three strikes now. <laughs> You've set three dates, and they've all failed. And this is where you have this whole new emergence of, uh, you know, Hiram Edson in the cornfield. Oh, let's take what he said, and Ellen White confirms that, and this vision's from the Lord. And um, now we have the sanctuary doctrine that emerges. What Jesus really did was moved around in some heavenly sanctuary and started an investigative judgment. But all that stuff emerges when, after these other things have failed. You know, and, and now it's moving into this third and final phase of the investigate of the shut door, which is the investigative judgment and the sanctuary doctrine, which again is the unique doctrine in Adventism, but it's a ridiculous doctrine. You know, I, I don't know how many of you were raised with it or had it taught to you at a young age, but I can still remember, you know, Sabbath school teachers saying well, the investigative judgment starts with us. We're Adventists. We know the most. Judgment begins with the house of God. It begins with the people who know more than everybody else. And uh, God first starts judging the dead, but then he starts with the living. And he's probably judging the living by now because he's had a long time here. You know, I wasn't born until 1952. So that's a pretty long time to get the dead judged. And so, you know, my teacher would say right to us, you know, he's probably judging you today. And if you sin after he judges you, you're lost. That was not a good thing for me to hear because I was like sinning every day, many times, in multiplicities. Uh, <laughs> but I didn't take the Sabbath school teacher too seriously. My younger brother did, and I think it really... Uh, made an unfortunate impact on his life, this kind of theology. But, uh, you know, he's had to deal with a lot of this Adventist baggage, much more so than I have, because my philosophy is pretty much, there's a lot of crap here. I got to figure out what's going on and try to change this church. It's uh, not getting it together too well. But um, anyway, I didn't really succeed too much in that. But... Uh, 
Anyway, what the shut door really is, is over here in Matthew 25, 10 to 13, the end of our passage. And uh, it says, and while they went to buy, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day or hour in which the Son of Man will come. So, um, you know, when we look at this, it's interesting because it's saying while they went to buy, while they went to try to get this Holy Spirit that they hadn't cared enough about to pursue earlier, um, the time ran out and, and the door was shut. So that's where the shut door comes from. The door was actually shut and they couldn't get back in to the wedding. And, um, you know, I, I'm, as I say, I'm just really thankful that we're a spiritual family here that doesn't condemn the Holy Spirit, that doesn't condemn the gifts of the Holy Spirit, that doesn't get intimidated by talk of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, that doesn't try to attribute this stuff to the devil, um, because that's really bad news. And, um, you know, we don't want to be on that list that finds themselves outside the door. And what it, this clearly does imply is that there will be a close of probation before Jesus returns. And, and of course, you do find references to that in Scripture. Um, Revelation 22, 11 is one of the most famous, let him who's holy be holy still and let him who's lost in sin continue to be lost in sin let him who's unjust be unjust still and filthy be filthy still and righteous be righteous still and holy be holy still so you've got this reference uh, that happens before the return of Christ and you've got of course Revelation 13 and 14 which talks about those who receive the mark of the beast and then those who see it receive the seal of God, Revelation 14, 1, in their foreheads. And, uh, you know, the implication, the, the clear teaching of Revelation there as you read it, is that this isn't going to change. Those who have uh, the name of God written in their foreheads, the Father's name, they're not going to go back. Uh, that's, that's a seal of God, and it's a permanent seal of God. And, um, you know, I, I think the important thing here is that Jesus says, I don't know you. You know, th those are powerful words to people who think they're waiting his return. I don't know you. And uh, makes me think of John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. And they follow me. Um, you know, Jesus makes it very clear that his sheep who hear his voice, he knows them. And he's also saying, my sheep do hear my voice. They don't just read my word. They don't just have the letter that kills. They have the spirit that gives life. They're being spirit led. They're learning better and better how to hear the voice of God, how to receive this discernment that we were talking about today. Uh, I loved having Keith at prayer meeting Tuesday night because he's been going through these awesome experiences, encounters with God, where he's learning to hear God's voice as he never has before. And he's just so enthusiastic about this. And it was just so neat to see his mom there too, Arlene, just all smiles because she's been praying for this for years, that, that her son would have this kind of an encounter with God and it's all coming true. And they were just uh, so thrilled, you know, and th so excited about what God is doing. Knowing God is inseparable from hearing his voice. Knowing God is inseparable from hearing his voice. That's what Jesus says. So the main thing we get out of this parable, the lesson that we need to learn is that God speaks to us. As his sheep, we learn to hear him, and he knows us. He knows us. He's never going to say, I don't know you.
This is the lesson we learned from a tale of ten virgins. God bless you.